Hello, and welcome to the 1.4 version update of the Zoya Librarian. And happy 10K Zoya Day. Uh, very exciting. Uh, Ambrose just announced that they are celebrating the 10,000 units of the original Zoya with a limited edition beige petal um, available today, right now. Um, it, it's an amazing color. It comes with a uh, new blue OLED screen. Um, as well as a new version 5.0 firmware update um, that's available on all units. You can download the firmware on their site and apply it to any Zoe you have. Um, inside the update, you'll find two new effects modules, a reverse delay and a univibe, as well as a CPU performance increase um, on code, code side, not hardware. Um, uh, they say about 14% on average for most patches. So that means that patches that are bumping right up against that 105% threshold for digital clipping and nastiness will no longer encounter that issue. Uh, so folks who are having some problems with the sample files or loading up on super heavy duty patches can rest easy now. We have plenty of space. Um, I, I've been testing that extensively to make sure that you know most of Christopher's patches if we're being honest, um, are working totally fine now, which is which is awesome news. Um, so I mentioned the new modules. I want to dive into that a little bit. Um, um, to support the update, I have um, introduced a new version of the librarian, which has a, a couple new features, uh, but mostly a solidification of the existing features and some bug, fix bug fixes uh, going on. So first, uh, let's take a look at um, just a reminder about the help screen. So in here, you can find a set of documentation um, between the application and the, the pedal itself, um, user manual, FAQs, the firmware change log, module index, and tips and tricks. So if you look in the module index, this has a list of all the modules in Zoya, as well as a brief description, the block counts, rough CPU, and the options, as well as what what the blocks are and how they how they work. So uh, this is a quick reference for you if you, if you ever want to look at it. Uh, but we'll scroll to the bottom just to a brief look at the the new modules. So the first one is a reverse delay, relatively self-explanatory, but it has some really cool features. Uh, first of all, it's a stereo reverse delay, which is awesome. Uh, second of all, it has two methods of getting a delay time. So you have the standard sort of millisecond delay. And then you have a tap tempo um, that works similarly to the other delays, but instead it comes with a tap ratio block. So by default, you can dial in whatever ratio you want without needing to use a clock divider or anything like that. There's also um, delay feedback, mix, and a pitch control, which um, allows you to dial in some like even tide crystals type of you know feedbacking pitchy delays. Um, in reverse, but also it has a really cool 10 semitone option for like micro shifts, which is really awesome, as well as the fourth uh, and octaves. So lots of cool options there with, with the pitch control uh, and the feedback to really get you into that CT5, count to five moody territory. So really, really cool there. Uh, the second new module is the Univibe. Um, so this is a stereo univibe, uh, and it's a pretty standard sort of modulation effect in Zoya, where it has three different methods of um, affecting the the delay time in the univibe because it's it's based on a delay line. Uh, we have these uh, rate milliseconds, we have a tap tempo, and we have a CV direct, um, which works like the flanger or the um, the phaser, where you can direct any CV signal into that and use that as your modulation source instead of like a sine wave that's built into the rate or tap tempo options. There's also depth control, resonance, and mix for that univibe. Uh, it takes dirt very, very well in my experience from testing it. Um, I'm admittedly not a huge fan of univibe, but this does sound very good and I'm, I'm happy to see it included. Um, I'm sure it'd make a lot of folks very happy. So that's the sort of the extent of the update in addition to the CPU increases, which is amazing. Um, so now we'll get into the actual application side of things, what has changed, what has, you know, what has been fixed type of thing. 
So we're going to look into local storage. Um, if folks remember last time, uh, the 1.3 update included a button to upload to patch storage. Um, so this has been uh, modified slightly. So one, make the process easier to do so. Basically what happens is when you upload the patch to patch storage, it creates a patch storage entry and then it reconfigures this patch to then have the same format as the ones that are already on patch storage. So for example, the one below this decorrelate, it has the patch notes, it has the information about the author, downloads, license, a preview file if there is one, and a link to the patch storage site right here. Whereas this one has no link because there is no patch storage um, entry associated with this patch. So when you upload to patch storage with this button, it's going to prompt you for a couple things. It's going to prompt you for one, uh, an image. So I'm just going to put a generic image that I have saved. And then it's going to prompt for a license. So the, there's a list of licenses here. You can, you can pick whatever one. They're all the ones that are supported on the patch storage site. Um, All right, so that got updated. So now when we click on the patch again, we see it has my author name on it, the license, and it has a link. Beautiful. So that process has been simplified and made very seamless. The second thing that was added is uh, inside the, the API that Patch Short has developed for this, um, that enables us to do this a wonderful thing is um, a way to update patches, which didn't exist in the previous version. So in 1.4, you can now update existing patches with a new version, which is really, really cool for maintaining version history. You don't have to go onto the website if you don't want to. Basically what it does is um, you can make a modification to the patch. You can change you know, where the blocks are. You can change basically anything about it. You can also just change the meta, the patch notes metadata. You could say version two, update patch notes. And now let's say I wanna update this. Well, since it's the same sort of API call, we just use the same button. So if we do upload to patch storage, it's gonna go through the process and it's gonna say when it was updated with that new version, which is really, really cool. So we're going to go over to the patch storage tab and we're going to check that information. So we'll do a quick refresh. So I click on multi-tool. There's our version two. Really, really um, tight integration with the patch storage um, site is something that I really wanted to nail with, with this application. So I'm super happy with this functionality. The last thing I'll note about this upload update sort of method um, is that, don't worry, there are safeguards. If I try to modify a patch that was not created by myself, it's, it's going to tell me that I can't do anything. So if I try to upload the patch storage, it tells me that I can only modify creatures, patches that I created myself. So that's a safeguard against you overriding someone else's extremely hard work that deserves the credit for themselves. So that's the safeguard against that. Um, and that's based on your credentials that you enter for the site because the API key is linked to your user account and your user account has your user metadata and all that stuff. All right. So that is the update to the uh, API connection. Again, update and upload. Use the same button. The way that it works is totally different. Um, the just to recap, the upload only allows you to do patches that were locally imported. You can send them to the site. The update only works on patches that you have created yourself um, to prevent overrides. All right. Um, so in this process of um, doing this update, update upload um, method, um, I decided to make an update to the sort of backend um, metadata for all of your local patches. 
Um, so the first time that you open up version 1.4, it will most likely, um, if you have a lot of patches saved, it's going to take a little while longer because it has to refresh that metadata and all those JSON files. So that's going to take a little while uh, to upload, um, to update um, those the first time. But after you do it once, it doesn't go through the whole process again. It checks and makes sure um, that everything's good. And so you'll get normal load times after that. Um, next, um, this was a feature request. Uh, someone requested the ability to sort the local storage by latest download. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to pick a patch that's pretty old because normally what happens in previous versions of, of the application is if you try to download a patch from years and years, years ago, it's going to show much lower in the list in local storage because it's sorted by latest modified date. Um, so I changed that behavior. Basically, there's a modified date, which is sort of the date that's saved here, and a downloaded date, which is this basically the timestamp of you hitting the download patch button. And it's going to sort that local storage by those dates. So if we download this Frost Piano patch, and then we go to local storage, it's right there. Beautiful. So it still says date modified is 2020, um, but there's an additional date um, that's being used for sorting for date downloaded. Um, so that's that's that was added, which is really cool. Um, so so that's the extent of the sort of additions. It's a it's a small list, but I think it really sort of makes things uh, a lot easier. Uh, for integrating between local and storage views of your patches. The rest of this list are uh, fixes and some general notes about the application as we go. Um, so I already mentioned the simplification sort of modifications of the upload. That's one of the fixes. Uh, the second is um, SD cards. Uh, so normally when you're, um, let's do an export for example. So let's export this patch Uh, it's going to prompt you for a slot number uh, exporting to whatever folder you have as your export directory. Um, in the past, if you had multiple patches saved um, in that file number, because of the way that Zoe works is it doesn't get rid of the files, it just sort of like indexes them. Um, this will wipe out the old ones. So basically you would, you would have um, just the single patch so it doesn't encounter any errors. So that, that was fixed. Um, okay, when you uh, import a version history, so again, what, if you, can, you can import a version history um, from a folder. So that way it gives you sort of like a, um, a single view of that folder. I'm just gonna do something real quick. Um, basically what would happen in the past I fixed it, but basically, so this is this is a sort of the outcome of the the version history upload. This is all the patches that I sort of saved on my personal Zoya. Um, what would happen is there'd be a a list of empty patches because the SD card needs empty files to sort of pad the length. Um, I fixed that process, so basically there will be no more empty patches included in the version history um, import. So that was fixed. Um, it fixed a pretty large bug uh, related to the um, data JSON formats um, for the API. Uh, so that data JSON comes from the patch stories list. Um, um, so that process was fixed um, and stops us from encountering errors when trying to download or um, even open the application it was causing issues. So that was fixed. Um, there was also an issue with downloading samples. So if you tried to download a patch with samples, the sample file would not load, um, which was obviously problematic because you want the WAV file to actually work. Um, so that was fixed. Uh, so apologies, apologies there, your, your WAV files will now actually have audio in them and not just be an empty file. Um, minor things, bump some, version, bump some version libraries. I was also able to remove some dependencies from the application, which was pretty cool. Um, in my experience, um, these projects tend to get a lot of tech debt and bloat. So the ability to remove dependencies as you go is super, super 
um, it's a nice thing to have. It also cuts down on the file size of the application. Uh, the Mac app is like 44 megs. Um, it used to be like 60 or something. So cutting down on those extra dependencies, it helps. It, it's just a nice thing to have. Plus it's less overhead for, for me when I'm developing. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the extent of the new features and the fixes. Um, the final thing I'll make a note of is feature plans for the application. Um, so I still plan on implementing some sort of patch editing, patch creation. It's just, it's a complicated process and I don't have a ton of time to really devote to it, um, unfortunately, um, with work and, and everything else. Um, so at this point, what I will say is the app is 99% feature complete. It does what it set out to do. It has patch storage integration. It has local storage. It has SD card. It has ways to make folders and patches it rearranges things it really simplifies simplifies your experience with zoya so i would say that goal has been achieved so i'm going to call it 99 percent feature complete um, so future updates will address bugs um, minor feature requests such as things making it smoother with the ui and, and that kind of stuff uh, but don't expect too many large new things going in the future um, asterisk caveat um, that patch editing. I do want to implement, I don't know if I'll ever get to it, but hopefully uh, at some point. So yes, um, you can read all the patch notes um, in the repository. There's a change log. Um, there's the user manual, which I updated. And there's this video, which you're currently watching, or maybe not because it's the end of the video. Anyway, enjoy the new firmware update uh, and the new Zoya Lab update and the 10K Zoyas, don't forget about those. Um, thanks a lot.